Next on Lectures in History, James Hope, a landscape painter before the Civil War, enlisted with the Union Army's 2nd Vermont Volunteers and witnessed the 1862 Battle of Antietam firsthand. Shepherd University professor James Broomall teaches a class about his life and art, focusing on his paintings of Antietam's Bloody Lane and the artillery in front of Dunker Church. This class is about 70 minutes. Okay. Um... Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to basically continue our discussion of the Maryland campaign, but instead of talking about the battle itself, we're going to deal instead with the topic of visual representation and the idea of memory. So in some ways, this relates to the broader core um, themes of this class. And so today's lecture is a bit of a departure from what we've done thus far, but I think in many ways, it's going to interface with what we're going to be talking about over the course of this semester. And I want to start with a vignette from one soldier, a private, Calvin Leach. He's a soldier in the 1st North Carolina. His unit sees extensive combat at South Mountain as well as at Antietam. He maintains a small pocket diary over the course of his wartime service until he himself is killed in 1864. And discussing the events of September the 17th, 1862, here is what he writes. Today a fierce engagement followed all the day both by infantry and artillery. Our brigade was first in. Soon in the morning, the firing commenced, and very soon our regiment was under fire, the balls whistling over us and wounding and killing many of our brave boys. He then goes on and offers the very thorough description of the battle, but he ends with this incredibly pointed phrase. I often looked at the sun and longed for night to come so the firing would cease. So the firing would cease. Here's a man who, in fundamental ways, is undone by this conflict, like hundreds of thousands of other soldiers, desperate in the most fierce combat for that day to come to some sort of conclusion or end. There is heightened emotional expression and palpable uncertainty threaded through Calvin's words. And what I would argue and will argue and what you're reading in Drew Faust's book, This Republic of Suffering, is how core elements of Victorian culture come under attack, so to speak, because of the ferocity of this war. Now, how did soldiers, though, represent these feelings, represent the experience of combat? Well, on the one hand, we have diary entries, just like the one I read you. Those are available by the tens of thousands. We have letters, which many of you are reading for your blog entries, by the hundreds of thousands. But we also have visual representations. Attempts by painters to translate onto canvas the experience of combat, and by photographers to put on plate what they were seeing on these gruesome battlefields. So what we'll do today is we'll start to ask how public understandings of this conflict are shaped by these visual representations and what these visual representations sought to portray about the Civil War. And we're going to do so through the lens of one specific individual, James Hope. James Hope is a Union officer. He serves in the Vermont Brigade. He sees uh, combat through 1861 and 1862. And most importantly, he's an artist, a member of the Hudson River School. So we're going to talk a bit about that um, here in a couple minutes. And perhaps most importantly, James Hope created a series of paintings that were meant to teach, to convey a lesson about the experience of war. These canvases are to today displayed at the Antietam National Battlefield. And if you go down to the Visitor Center and to the main museum gallery, on four of those walls are the Hope canvases, five murals that are kind of silent testimonies to the events of uh, uh, September 1862. Now, Hope, as an artist, knew how to stir the emotions of his viewers. I'm going to give you some examples here. These are two images that capture the grandeur of nature. On the left-hand side is a scene from Watkins Glen, New York, where he spent the majority of his career as an artist. And the lower right-hand side is a sawmill from New England. Now, 
what types of feelings do these pictures elicit or evoke for you? How, what do you think of when, you're, when you see these? How do you respond? Peace? Tranquility. Tranquility. Quietude. Contemplation, right? And that's exactly what he's intending to do. Once again, same thing. Calm mountains, very soft colors. But what happens when we put this particular part of the image into a broader context? This is his painting titled After the Battle. The mountains are still present. The landscape is still there. But what the landscape artist has now done is he's populated his landscape with the dead and the dying. He's transformed a quiet, sunken road, a farm lane, into a temporary burial pit. And if you look back at these hills, it's almost as though the landscape itself is turning red. Hope paints at least three versions of this scene, and he exhibits them in the 1880s and the 1890s. The works are chilling depictions. He then uses his son, James Hope, a talented photographer, to reproduce uh, images of the canvases. After the battle, in many ways, though, represents just the beginning. This is the first scene that Hope chooses to paint, but then he goes on to do four more depictions of the Antietam battlefield. Now, what's so interesting to me is that these particular images done in the 1880s mark a fundamental departure in the career of James Hope. In fact, the first wartime scenes that he chose to paint during the war years, 1862, 63, 64, and 65 is when he's active, are relatively orthodox camp scenes. We're going to see those here in a couple minutes. Yet three, de- three decades later, he chooses an entirely different subject matter. And that begs to me at least an important question of why. And even more remarkably, these are among the last works of this artist for he dies in 1892. He leaves these five monumental testimonies to the horrors of war for audiences to consume and contemplate and meditate on. So then we need to ask what prompts this transformation in his career and what it tells us more broadly about the experiences of veterans who chose to portray their experiences in some sort of tangible form. So that's what we're after today. Now, I think this is worthy on three particular counts. First, James Hope himself is relatively obscure. His images are featured quite frequently. Time Life Books, a long time ago, put out a multi-volume series on the Civil War. They're kind of silver-bound volumes. I got them when I was a kid. The Hope paintings figure into the centerpiece of the Antietam volume. These paintings are included in some of the monumental studies of Civil War art. They feature prominently in the Antietam battlefield. Yet James Hope himself, relatively obscure. So I think the works are worthy of mention, worthy of discussion, simply on their own merit. So that's one goal of today. We'll simply explore. We'll explore James Hope and his art. Two, as I've hinted at, These works represent some sort of fundamental departure for the artist and also, in many ways, are are departures from what was pretty popular in 19th century culture, other depictions of the the, um, experience of war, which we will also talk about today. So there's some sort of shift going on within the art community that I think, in many ways, interfaces with how audiences are consuming that war through photography and through other media. And then finally... I want us to think about using different forms of evidence. So over the course of this semester thus far, you've been working on your blogs, you've done incredibly well, and you're using primarily letters and diaries. What other forms of evidence are available to you as burgeoning scholars? Can you think about, for instance, art as a way to highlight the experiences of the men that you're discussing in your blog entries? This is a very different type 
a different, uh, different type of evidence, obviously. We're going to have to look at it in a different way, but I'm hoping that we can pick up some skill sets today as we go through these, these depictions to think about how this might interface with your own work. So those are our three overarching goals. Now, in order to kind of give this teeth, I want to ground this a bit in what we've talked about earlier in the semester and link this artistic movement to what is going on in antebellum America. I'm going to be very brief because we talked about it obviously at length, but I think it's very necessary for us to understand the romance that many Americans felt about America, about its landscapes, and how that romance in many ways was shattered by the experience of war. Now, as we talked about in the first weeks of the semester, the United States was expanding quite rapidly. And for many Americans, a romance grew out of the land, out of Americans' relationship to it, and their accomplishments within it. We also know from our, discuss from our discussions that an increasingly industrialized Northeast East is transforming that landscape in fundamental ways. It's a fleeing landscape for some. So these artists are trying to pick up on canvas the forests, the prairies, the valleys, the mountains that many of them thought were quickly disappearing. A tightly knit community of painters out of New York City sought to ply their skills in the Hudson River Valley, focusing on the Catskill Mountains, going up into beyond New York, up into Vermont, showing the immense magnitude of these scenes of beauty, following the advice of one critic, John Ruskin, to give close scrutiny to the details of, ma of nature in order to portray its essence. Now, Asher Durand is among the most important architects of this Hudson River School, and he encouraged painters to, quote, go first to nature to learn to paint landscape, and only then may the neophytes study the pictures of great artists with benefit. Go to the source. Go to the landscape itself. Learn from nature. That is ultimately your subject matter. That's ultimately where you need to immerse yourself. Moreover, there is a political dimension to what they're doing. Durand goes on, and he says, quote, in the midst of a great commercial crisis, an effort has been organized, having as its object the education of our countrymen to the perception and enjoyment of beauty. Okay? Now, hope doesn't quite achieve the technical sophistication of Frederick Church, whose images, uh, one of his images rather, is pictured here. He doesn't quite become as famous as Asher Durand, but he is clearly a member of the Hudson River School, and he also actually solicits the advice of Durand at one point in his career. And Durand tells him, as he did to many, work directly from nature. Don't work from sketches. And so in the 1850s and into the Civil War era, we have then many, many of these artists producing these extremely popular images that are capturing, capturing rather, the beauty of the landscape, the natural world. Now, for Hope, he is going to set up a studio in New York City. It's going to become quite successful. And throughout the 1850s, he's going to travel between New York City and Vermont, where his family is living. So he's going back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth, until ultimately the outbreak of the American Civil War. And just like the individuals that you've been studying in your blog entries, Hope is swept up with the rage military that's sweeping across the northern states in the spring and summer of 1861. He joins the 2nd Vermont Infantry. They're mustered into service on June the 1st, 1861, and over the course of their military career, they will see action in 12 major engagements. Here is Hope pictured on the right-hand side as a captain, a captain in charge of Company B, the second Vermont. Here is a self-portrait that pays homage to his um, Scottish ancestry. And this is something that he himself did. Now, at Antietam, the Vermont Brigade isn't going to see extensive action. They're going to come over the Antietam Creek sometime around 6 a.m. They're going to cross in the area of Prize Ford, which is opposite Keatesville. Um, near the upper bridge, and they're going to be ordered to support Major General John Sedgwick's division, which is crashing into the West Woods. 
At the very last minute, however, they're rerouted and told instead to support the assaults on the famed sunken road, Lay Lane. And so the regiment is going to fall into line on the flank of William French's division near the Mama or Muma farm. And throughout the course of the battle, they're going to be positioned somewhere in this area along the Muma farm lane. They're going to be looking over the action that's occurring in the sunken road. They're going to be bombarded by artillery over the course of the 17th, but they themselves are not going to be directly engaged in combat. Hope himself is detached from the regiment. We actually don't quite know where he is on the battlefield. Our assumption is that he's probably spending time with the Vermont Brigade. He's probably somewhere in this area. And this is going to interface with the, the pictures that he later does about the battlefield because this area in particular is the subject of the majority of his Antietam paintings. So we have to wonder. Hope himself doesn't really write about what he sees or what he experiences, but what did other members of the Vermont Brigade see and experience? Well, we have quotes. One member of the 2nd Vermont wrote, in very grim detail, a short distance from me is a road with a fence rail on each side, and for nearly half a mile, the road is so full of of dead rebels that one could hardly step between the bodies. Some places lying one and two deep, lying on top of each other, On the fence is a dead man, partly over when killed. This sight is awful. Another member of the 2nd Vermont, Nelson Dodge, writes, The field was covered with the dead and the wounded. All night they cried help, but we cannot help them. The next we advanced. To see the dead piled up was enough to make anyone sick. Some without legs, some arms gone, some with their brains all shot out. There was one with ten bullet holes in him. Those that I saw as most rebs, they all had lay on the ground so long that they smelt terrible. They were all mortified. I think I've read enough about it for now, for I can't bear to think of it. And here's a soldier who spells largely phonetically. It's a bit of a jumpy letter, but you can get the emotions. They're very clearly portraying the horrors that they're witnessing. We think that hope was probably bearing witness to these scenes as well. We don't know for sure, but that's what we think. Now, you're also reading, of course, this Republic of Suffering, and you know that Faust, uh, Drew Goodman Faust, spends a lot of time in her book talking about the burial of the dead, talking about how these burial practices are being transformed in the midst of this experience, and, of course, one of the monumental problems that these Civil War soldiers must confront are the sheer numbers, the sheer numbers of dead men. And so, in this scene that we just heard, we have about half a mile or more of a sunken farm lane that is filled with bodies. And as Lee retreats on the evening of September the 18th, that leaves Union soldiers, the victors on the ground, and the duty ultimately falls to them. It's their obligation to bury those Union and Confederate dead. What we know is captured both through sketch and through the photographer's lens. In the lower left-hand side, we have a very remarkable image of what occurred on the sunken road in the days following the battle. Mass burial pits are dug on the outside of that farm lane, and there, ultimately, these men are being placed by the dozens and then eventually by the hundreds. This particular task falls to the 130th Pennsylvania. A young officer, John Hayes II, is ultimately in charge of the burial detail. He writes after the war, the work began on Friday afternoon and was finished on Sunday afternoon. He claims about 440 Confederates were ultimately buried. Now one of the things that Faust talks about I want you to start thinking about is how do you identify all of these men? Is it possible to identify all these men. And of course, as Faust says, no. One of the remarkable figures from the Civil War is approximately 40% of all Confederate dead are unidentified. And so these mass burial pits are being placed these bodies. And in many cases, these bodies are being buried without the notification of the families. Perhaps soldiers were, were writing scrap notes in their spare time as they're trying to flee the field, making notation of who is buried where. 
But this kind of adds to the gravity of these scenes that are unfolding. And again, we have to think, if Hope goes to this for his first portrait, he must have been profoundly struck by what he saw. And indeed, the Vermont Brigade was positioned in this very area through the 19th of September. They oversaw on the 18th, the 19th, the duties of these burial parties, the the grim details that were being dispatched to take care of the Confederate dead. And we can argue, we don't know, but we can argue that perhaps these scenes haunted Hope as they surely haunted hundreds of other Americans. Again, turning to Drew Faust, she writes, On the one hand, these men are going to find relief through religion. Americans North and South held tenaciously to deeply rooted beliefs that would enable them to make sense of the slaughter that was almost unbearable. So they rely upon core elements of Victorian culture to navigate the horrors of this war. But, as Faust also says, they're pushed into realms of uncertainty. As men saw, and this is Faust, Faust, themselves mirrored in the faces of those expiring around them, they struggled to come to terms with the possibility and significance of their own annihilation. This is a culture being transformed. This is a culture being changed by these scenes. And it is leaving indelible marks upon the participants of this war. And we can argue that James Hope was one of them. And in fact, what we know is that Hope is going to be discharged from the service in December of 1862 because of disabilities sustained during his service. Now, another of the themes that we've discussed in this class, of course, is that while Civil War combat is extremely deadly business, the majority of Civil War soldiers are going to probably succumb to some sort of disease. And that's exactly what happens to James Hope. Well into the post-war period, as he's applying for a pension, Some of his neighbors are interviewed. Hiram Streeter, a neighbor of Hope, testified, quote, Before the war, he was a landscape artist who traveled miles on foot, heavily loaded with materials. He was known far and near as a tough, rugged man, robust and strong and very active. Yet, Streeter continues, when he returned, he complained of chronic diarrhea and rheumatism. Toward the end of his life, Hope himself described another painful injury sustained during his military service. Quote, I noticed first a loud ring in my ear or ears during the Battle of Antietam, which I suppose at the time was caused by the incessant noise of battle acting on my weak nerves, as I was quite worn out by sickness and continuous duty. So he thinks because of the just the loud, thunderous noise of artillery, perhaps he's gone temporarily deaf. But what he says is, this condition continues. And then he does go completely deaf in one ear. And then he writes, for the remainder of his days, it sounded like there was heavy waterfalls coming down in one of his ears. He argued the effects of artillery. So the Civil War, it seems, would remain with James Hope for the remainder of his life. Now, I want to take a bit of a departure here because it's significant to note that Antietam is one of the first, it was the first, rather, battlefield in which there's still unburied dead. They're going to be documented by photographers. And this story is so significant because Hope himself is going to be influenced by the images I'm going to talk about here in a minute, and audiences themselves are responding to these these images and understanding the war in very different terms. And so Antietam is a very significant turning point on a whole number of different fronts that we've talked about and will continue to talk about. But one of the interesting things is it's a technological kind of uh, turning point as well. So Alexander Gardner and his assistant James F. Gibson traveled to the Antietam battlefield from Washington, D.C. They most likely came across South Mountain and then made their way across Antietam Creek before moving on to the battlefield, probably on the 18th of September, though the photographs themselves are taken between the 19th and the 22nd. Remarkably, over that period of time, there's about 70 images that are taken. They stay through October and ultimately create 95 images of the battlefield of 
significant sites on the battlefield, of unburied bodies in the immediate aftermath, of important military leaders, and so on. It's an incredible documentation that unfolds. Now, what's interesting to me is many contemporaries compare photographers to painters. So, Humphrey's Journal notes that the famed photographer Matthew Brady, quote, compared to a painter of historical battle scenes. And what's important for us to note is that photographs aren't clear depictions of reality. They, like paintings, are staged scenes. In some instances, the ways in which photographers stage the scenes are quite dramatic. So when we go to Gettysburg next week, we'll talk about one particular Confederate who's dragged 70 yards, photographed twice. Um, But in other instances, they're capturing very specific vignettes. They're choosing where exactly they want to shoot their image, how they want to frame the shot, what debris perhaps can be lined up to make the scene even more pointed. Um, the bodies themselves, in some cases, have been moved before they're going into the bur- uh, bef- by the burial uh, parties. So these are manipulated scenes. So there actually is a really nice correlation between the, the ph- photographer and the painter. And then second, as I've, always hint- as I've hinted at, Hope himself is influenced by these photographs, as we'll talk about in some of his later paintings. These are really crucial representations of the battle that permeate 19th century culture. Now, in late October 1862, the images themselves are going to be released to the public under the label Brady's Album Gallery. Not Gardner, but Brady. This is a pretty common practice. Brady himself is the one that had the economic means. He's the one that employed the personnel. He's the one that had the famed gallery in New York City. And so Brady is the one who's given most of the credit for these images, and Brady is the one who's going to first show these images in an exhibit titled The Dead of Antietam. Now, the New York Times publishes an anonymous article about this particular exhibit. It's something that historians quote quite often, but I think it bears repeating because of some of the ideas that are conveyed in this very brief quote. And it goes something like, well, it doesn't. It says this. As it is, the dead of the battlefield come up to us very rarely, even in dreams. We see the list in the morning paper at breakfast, but dismiss its recollections with the coffee. There is a confused mass of names, but they are all strangers. And that's a key concept. For most people, as they go through the tallies of the dead, the names are ultimately meaningless. But then the story goes on. Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought the bodies and laid them in our doorsteps and along our streets, he has done something very like it. He has, in essence, provided a face to otherwise anonymous slaughter. He has, in very specific ways, forced audience to grapple in intimate ways with this wrenching emotional experience of combat. He is transforming, in other words, how Americans are consuming the war, how they're thinking about the war. And he's also changing the subject matter for most Americans in the 18th century into the 19th century have been consuming war through paintings that were often the stuff of romantic myth or heroic legend. And we're going to talk about all those paintings here in a minute. There's nothing romantic about this. There's nothing heroic about the dead along the Hagerstown Turnpike. But, as I suggested, this war as a transformative moment is something that's a work in progress. Change is coming very slowly. And so, when Hope first turns to the experience of war, after he's discharged from service, he does what he knows best. And he's going to make rather conventional depictions of combat, of military life. And so, in the lower left-hand side, you'll see an image of a soldier. And I want to ask, what is the subject? What's the main subject of the image in the lower left-hand side? What's the main subject? 
Jessica, yeah. Nature. 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 The soldier himself is incredibly small. He's overwhelmed, in fact, by the forest that envelops him. Only off in the deep distance can you see some hints of camp. So it seems that the landscape artist is doing what he knows incredibly well. He's painting a landscape. And then on the right-hand side, we have a camp scene again. Um, it's kind of bucolic, kind of peaceful. It elicits, I would argue, the same emotions that the other paintings that I talked about at the very beginning of class do, right? Quietude, contemplation. This is what Hope first attempts to do when he first attempts to engage in the Civil War. He paints scenes of camp. He paints scenes that in many ways emphasize nature. He doesn't portray scenes like the ones that we just saw photographed. Now, over time, Hope's ambitions are going to expand, as do his canvases. And this particular painting is four and a half by ten and a half feet. It's a pretty big canvas, pretty big scene on which he works. And what he sought to do here is portray the 80,000-man army of the Potomac, the one that we spoke of on the peninsula. Here they are pictured um, at Cumberland Landing, on the Pamunkey River, and the man that we spent some time talking about, George B. McClellan, is pictured here at the front, leading this vast army of men in charge of this monumental tent city. And again, what does this particular image elicit? Okay, so we certainly again see the importance of landscape. What else does it convey? Grandeur, helping. Grandeur, the power of the army. And that's, that's exactly right, because now we're, as he's working on this, it's towards the end of the war, it's 1864, 1865. But now at this point, we want to convey the vastness of this military machine. And in fact, an article in Scientific America proclaims, if our reader desires a clear and vivid depiction of the actual appearance and extent of an army of 80,000, let them look at this painting. And then the article says something very pointed. It shows what a great thing an army is. What a great thing an army is. I titled this lecture, What a Terrible Thing War Is. Those are Hope's words. But at this point in his career, he has garnered the approbation, the praise of military leaders. McClellan was incredibly happy with this painting, probably because he's depicted very prominently in it. Um, but he's also showing the immense magnitude of this military machine. And what's interesting is Hope is also doing something that's a bit of a departure in the art world going back to the 18th century, and that is he's showing soldiers as they appeared in life. This is a very famous image, Benjamin West, the death of Wolf. This is during the Seven Years' War, well, outside our purview, that's the, the, the realm of Dr. Bankhurst. Um, <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, I know a little bit about it, and I can tell you that this is a, a famed depiction of the death of a, a British general at the Battle of Quebec. Now, why West's painting matters is because the figures are not portrayed in symbolic Roman armor. They're not wearing togas, as was often portrayed in older paintings. They instead are wearing pre-realistic uniforms, carrying... Um, military arms of the era, they look like actual soldiers. This kind of creates a trend in art, and Hope, of course, is following this tradition, not quite 100 years later, um, with, with his depiction of a very realistic army of the Potomac. He's also working some political levers here, because in many ways, the idea of this burgeoning nation is being transformed by this experience of war, is now linked to art. It's demanding artistic treatment. And so many artists are seeking to portray the rebirth of this nation in the midst of war, to celebrate the scale of mobilization, to show federal forces in their full glory. Northern audiences wanted, according to one scholar, reassurances that their loved ones and heroes were thriving not suffering as they march into battle to save 
the union. Hope is also making a profit. <laughs> um, like many painters, of course, <laughs> this is his main means of survival. And there is a ready-made market for this type of artwork and for the prints that are being produced. Audiences are consuming this stuff at a very rapid rate. They are very interested in finding souvenirs and collectibles related to this war. This is the grand event of their lives, and they want something with which to remember it by. So he's done pretty well, despite the disabilities sustained during his military service throughout the 1860s. And then in 1872, he chooses to change fronts. He's going to move to Watkins Glen, New York, the place I mentioned earlier. It's a place known for its natural beauty, has a thriving uh, tourist community each year that come in and out to see the waterfalls. It's near Seneca Lake. The National Academy elects him as an associate member, and his professional reputation is starting to soar. He builds a gallery. And this gallery is featured in a local guide that says it is, quote, beautifully lighted and contains a superb collection of more than 100 of Hope's finest paintings. Here can be the leading scenes in Watkins Glen and its surroundings. Also scenes in New England, Virginia, California, Europe, Sicily, chief among which of which are his celebrated Rainbow Falls and the great historical painting that I just spoke of, the Army of the Potomac. Audiences would be charged 25 cents to go through the gallery, and at that point they could, as the article went on to say, enjoy a picnic on the edge of the gorge. So, Hope seems to be doing incredibly well. Hope, at least on the outside, has turned us back to war. I would say, though, that's a wrong assertion. So again, as you're working through your blog projects, I want you to think about this, how people are outwardly portraying themselves on paper and what perhaps they're internally trying to process. Now, for a long time, historians argued that basically, once soldiers came back from the experience of war, they more or less were silent on the subject until the 1880s, a period of hibernation before ultimately a period of revival. Historians have called that dichotomy into question, and what they have found instead, of course, is that veterans began to sort out the war's varied meanings almost immediately. In some instances, they did so by discussing with other veterans what they had gone through. In other instances, they joined organizations like the Grand Army of the Republic, and there's Confederate counterparts, of course. Um, and it seems as though hope follows this trend in that at least on paper, he has very little to say about the experience of war. He turns away from the war in his painting career. And the only glimmers we see of engagement is through his membership in the GAR. And he is indeed a member. Now, what is notable, despite what I just said, is that by the 1880s, the Civil War is receding a bit into the background. One editorial in the New York Times, which appeared in 1889, ironically, two days after the anniversary of Antietam, contended, quote, events of the Civil War are now so far in the past that their anniversaries come and go without recognition, save in exceptional cases. And Antietam is going to illustrate these claims incredibly well. The Antietam battlefield languishes. It receives very little visitation throughout the 1860s, 70s, and 80s barring the one instance of the National Cemetery created in 1867. That does receive visitation of the battlefield itself, languishes. In 1881, however, the Shenandoah Valley Railroad, operating between Hagerstown, Maryland, and Waynesboro, Virginia, starts to bring newfound attention to Sharpsburg. So, of course, today, if you're driving north into Maryland, that's the station that you see on the left-hand side um, that's marked uh, with a series of uh, a signage talking about its history. And then, indeed, by the mid-1880s, veterans start coming back to the Antietam battlefield in great numbers. And as it ends up, in 1888, one of the veterans who chooses to return to the Antietam battlefield is none other than James Hope. He comes to the battlefield, we think, with a group of veterans who are celebrating the 26th anniversary of the battle. From what we can gather... The men probably shared stories about the events of September, 
They recalled what had happened on that momentous day and the days before and afterwards. There's no archival record telling us this, but that's what we think. That's what we can conjecture. And again, what we have instead of his direct words is his art. Because this seems to have been a watershed moment in Hope's life, in his career as a painter. Because when he comes back in 1888 to New York, he sets himself the task of capturing what unfolded on September the 17th and in its aftermath onto canvas. Now, I was curious about this. Did he spend a lot of time in this area? Did he just go there once? And as it ends up, and here's the benefit of digging deep into the archives, and in this instance, I was assisted by someone, John Deemer, a friend of the, of the Civil War Center. And John found an article in the Shepherdstown Register, a local paper which is available online. And an 1889, uh, sorry, 1891 article said that James Hope, the artist, had been staying in Sharpsburg. He had been making a painting at Burnside Bridge in the vicinity, and he had been working on the canvas for three years, going back and forth between New York and this community. So it seems then that James Hope not only came here in 1888, he came to come back to this area, probably working through the way that he had been taught, work not from sketches but instead directly from nature. So here now Hope, who perhaps... Perhaps I thought little about the war. We don't know, but perhaps I thought little about the war. Had definitely let it recede somewhat into the background. Now seems to be coming back to these grounds. Weekly, monthly, yearly. And what's interesting to me is that the canvases that he ultimately produces are powerful, terrible scenes of the war, far removed from anything that he had done thus far in his career. There's shocking scenes of feudal charges, depictions of decaying bodies, and portraits of blasted landscapes. And they would ensure that future audiences would not forget, as many veterans were fearing, the events of that great war. Now, at this point in time, many audiences were consuming art of this sort. Chromolithographs. Um, At this point, uh, cycloramas are incredibly popular. Is everyone a cyclorama? Okay, yeah. yeah. So imagine this circular room being entirely covered with with a painting. Cycloramas were incredibly popular. Audiences are clamoring for this type of stuff. There's cycloramas done of uh, Shiloh, Gettysburg, um, Atlanta. Um, And then many audiences are consuming images like this. Kurtz and Allison, an 1888 image titled The Battle of Antietam. And again, if I may, what do you see depicted here? Where are we placing ourselves on the battlefield first? Burnside Bridge. Okay, so we're at the the famed lower bridge, the Burnside Bridge, um, the, the site of action in the midday to afternoon of the battle, okay? And what do you see being portrayed? Meager death, but a relatively clean battlefield. A relatively clean battlefield, right. So we have, we have some dead and dying on the battlefield. We have very little debris, right? There's not a lot of stuff that's being strewn about. Um, how are the lines being portrayed? Orally. Okay, what do you mean poorly, Claire? Orderly. Oh, orderly. Oh, yeah, no. no yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there is a degree of truth to this, right? We know the Civil War armies, of course, fought standing up. We know that they fought in these orderly uh, formations. Um, but this is a pretty tidy battlefield. It's a pretty tidy scene um, that's unfolding here. And in fact, if you know much about this particular part of the action, it's a pretty big departure from reality. Um, I guess this is ultimately supposed to be the heights that the... Georgians were ensconced, and I'm not quite sure. But um, this is, but this is how audiences were. This is what they're consuming, in, in in large numbers. And these are incredibly popular works of art. And then again, we need to start thinking about what James Hope is doing at this same point in time. And again, he's not the first, not by you know any stretch of the imagination. 
but it still is a pretty marked departure from how most audiences are consuming the war at this point in time. Now, again, unfortunately, the archival record is relatively um, sparse, so we don't quite know how Hope was working. Um, one article written in the fall of 1888 said that Hope had captured a series of sketches, made a series of sketches in September of 1862. We also know from that other article in Shepherdstown that he was coming back to the battlefield, clearly working his canvas literally at the scenes that he was trying to portray. So it seems that between 1888 and 1891, he was moving between New York and Maryland, and, at that, and during that time he was actively working on uh, one canvas at a time because we also learned from another article that he had already completed after the battle before he started um, his depiction of Burnside Bridge, Burnside's Bridge. Now, what's also interesting is um, that it's very possible that Hope came into contact both in September of 1862 and then later in 1888 that young officer who was in charge of the burial parties, John Hayes. Uh, Philip Wheatman, who's a scholar on the Hope paintings, made a pretty interesting discovery that Hayes owned a photographic print of after the battle. So this image, again, was transformed into a very popular photographic print that audiences could buy for a relatively cheap figure and um, that Hope owns this. There's also in one of James Hope's catalogs a description that says that he talked to the young officer in charge of the burial party who was quoted as saying, round the point, referring to this area right here, they lay five or six deep. So what this means is Hope is conversing with other veterans, trying to piece together what had happened two-plus decades earlier in his youth, at a time that was incredibly trying, at a time that was creating physical injuries that he would be stuck with for the rest of his life. We know that he was going back to the battlefield itself to study those landscapes that he loved so much. And we also, of course, know that Hope was examining those images that Alexander Gardner had taken of scenes like the one at the Sunken Road. So there's all sorts of different forms of evidence that he's using as he's trying to compile his own portrayal of this profoundly important moment in time. Now, oops, sorry. Hope's actually going to use a bit of artistic license because we know, again, that when you compare this depiction to one of the famed Gardner images, this body grouping here is portrayed almost exactly as it's photographed. So Hope conveys on canvas the scenes from this photograph, but then he chooses to add this figure, a ghastly scene. And in the catalog description, Hope writes, the man kneeling in the foreground was in that position firing, was struck in the brain, and was so perfectly balanced that he never fell over. It's a man stuck in this liminal position, right? Body literally suspended in time. And so Hope chose to augment the horror of the sunken road by the inclusion of this particular figure. He also, interestingly, includes men draped over the fencing rail. And if you can recall the description of the Vermont soldiers, one said that there was a man hanging on the fence who had eight bullets in him. Again, suggesting that Hope had been talking to soldiers at the time, had been perhaps witnessing these scenes himself, and he sought to portray them on canvas in a period in which this is how many audiences are consuming the war in a very orderly, clean fashion that doesn't convey the horrors that he himself bore witness to. And the other veterans were determined audiences would continue to consume. Now, why he chooses this particular scene of all the other scenes in the battlefield, I think, is interesting. On the one hand, it's the aftermath. 
it demonstrates the horrific effect of small arms fire. It portrays a stillness in an area that had been once alive with wretched screams. And it showed to civilian audiences what they themselves could never understand, many veterans argued, about the experience of combat. It's something that they could never fathom. And again, that disconnect isn't as real as soldiers perceived it or portrayed it, but nonetheless is something that soldiers often felt that civilian audiences couldn't understand. And so here, hope puts it before audiences in very clear terms. Second, this is the scene of a vanquished enemy. Hope is a member of the GAR. Hope is a union man. Hope is a man fighting for the preservation of union. He is illustrating a moment of union triumph. The scene is horrible, no doubt. But in his catalog de- depiction, a uh, description rather, he draws upon the words of James Longstreet, the Confederate general, who says, the fresh troops of McClellan mowed down the RA ragged army of Lee like grass before the blade. A vanquished foe. This is the climatic point, right? This is the scene that ultimately is in the aftermath when Lee's army has retreated into Maryland. This is a moment of Union victory. And it's critical to note that Hope picks up on this theme in another one of his paintings, the one of Burnside's Bridge, a much more realistic depiction than the one offered by Kurtz and Allison. And in this scene, which focuses almost entirely on the Union soldiers, in this insert, I have this particular scene blown up to show you what? A group of captured and retreating Confederates. Now, there's going to be one departure from this, but nonetheless, it's notable. We have the dead. We have the retreating. These are scenes of Union victory. This is ultimately where, of course, McClellan's army almost turns Lee's flank. This is the point in which the battle was almost decided in favor. Well, it wasn't decided in favor of the Union, but almost critically decided in favor of the Union until ultimately A.P. Hill bolsters Lee's beleaguered flank. And so I think these, these paintings then have a political message. On top of one that, is, of course, is portraying the horrors of this, this, this battle, they also are trying to do something much more political. The men and women who are associated with the GAR explicitly embraced emancipation, liberty, if for no other reason than to say that slavery's death guaranteed the triumph of union. And, of course, on these fields was a Union victory that ultimately related, uh, resulted in the preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. Now, and today's been a lot of detective work, obviously. So we don't know exactly how these paintings were displayed at Watkins Glen in his gallery. What we have instead is a catalog description that Hope largely constructed that numbers these paintings one through five. And I think what he chooses... What scenes he chooses to number and what order is very telling. Again, this is one man's narrative, one man's record of the Battle of Antietam, and he chooses as number one, looking south, titled today by the National Park Service, Wasted Gallantry, the scene before you. Now, so all of you have been reading about Antietam a lot. And you know how the, the battle unfolds, but I'm guessing most of you probably haven't heard about this attack, barring our Antium intern and barring a few specialists here. But this is the attack of the 7th Maine. Does that ring a bell with a couple of you? This attack is going to occur in the late afternoon of September the 17th, back in the area of the sunken road, an area that had largely been decided in favor of the Union. The battle has shifted to other parts of the field. But this relatively obscure scene is the one that Hope tiles number one, looking south, the first, I think, in his series of paintings as he portrayed them. And there's a very important reason for that. Major Thomas Hyde, the commanding officer of the 7th Maine, was ordered to advance through the Piper cornfield 
depicted here, and to attack. In the 1904 description, Hope situates the pain by talking about the landscape. He loves landscape still, and landscape still figures prominently in his painting. But he then goes on and says, In the foreground is a section of the sunken road, with the seventh main dashing across it into the Piper cornfield, where they lost two thirds of their number. Now, this is a bit hyperbolic, but there was a very significant um, casualty count in this particular action. And what resulted from this action was basically nothing. Nothing. And the scene that Hope portrays is absolutely horrific. The living are intermingled with the dead. The officer, Major Hyde, wrote that as his regiment crossed the sunken road, which was so filled with the dead and dying, my horse had to step over them to get across it. Here's a man whose horse now is trampling upon the dead and dying. It's an absolutely horrific scene that Hyde remembers. And then in discussing the action, here's what he says. When we knew our efforts were the result of no plan or design from headquarters, but were the inspiration of an officer alone, I wished I had been old enough or distinguished enough to have dared to disobey them. To have dared to disobey them. This is a man who realized the futility of his attack and said ultimately, why? And this significantly, in Hope's catalog description, is scene number one, wasted gallantry. It's a pretty anti-war sentiment, if I've seen one, being expressed here on canvas. And again, to show what a terrible thing war is. Keep that in the back of your minds as you're going through these paintings that Hope constructed in the post-war period. Now, for the sake of time, I won't go through the whole catalog of, of his works, but we've talked about after the battle. We've talked about what's today, Waste of Gallantry, and we're going to conclude on this particular painting, what's today called Artillery Hell, which in the catalog is described as number two, looking west. This is a scene that should be pretty familiar to all of you because, of course, of this iconic building, Dunker Church. And this is the Dunker Church Plateau, that elevated position that caught Lee's eye on the 16th as a firm position from which he could ward off federal assaults and a place in which he could put artillery that would have command of the field. Now, James Hope, the artist, was certainly a student of the battle, was certainly one to capture authenticity, but he was also trying to convey an emotion. And again, each painting that we've seen thus far, I think, does convey a very explicit emotion. And so in this particular work, which has been the most criticized, he's compressing several hours of the battle into one scene. And I think he's doing so to convey a couple different ideas to his audiences. On the one hand, there is the very familiar notion of the sheer terror of the battlefield. In this particular scene, the artillerymen, still very much alive, are doing their deadly work with the dead and dying around them. And many of these men are actually dead and have gone into rigor mortis. Right? He portrays them as ghostly white, which stand in distinct contrast to the kind of peach faces of the artillerymen. Here is an individual that's been split in two by an artillery shell. James Hope is explicitly showing to his audiences just how deadly this artillery is. We can also wonder if Hope chose to portray this particular scene because, as we noted in his pension record, he suffered permanent hearing damage because of artillery, artillery fire. Again, his position on the battlefield suggests he could have seen parts of this action unfold, but I think there's also a very important message that he's trying to convey. In his description, he talks about the action in this part of the field, and at three different places in his description, he uses the phrase, terrific slaughter. Terrific slaughter. And once again, you can see a landscape being transformed, a landscape littered 
with wounded and dying men, a landscape that is being blasted apart by artillery shells, trees that have shot bursting in them, undoing ultimately nature's grandeur, nature's beauty. A surreal transformation of a landscape that he so dearly loved, that he was such a student of. And interestingly, as I suggested, he compresses the time frame of the battle on this painting. And what's important is this particular action that's going on here. This is the charge of Union General John Sedgwick's division into the West Woods. This is an action that, if you're you know, a student of the battle, you know pretty well. If you know the battle pro- broadly, you probably aren't as aware of. Suffice it to say for our purposes, these men charged headlong into the West Woods, largely unprepared for where they were going, largely unawares of what was going to confront them. And as they move into the West Woods, three lines deep, they're hit both in their front and their flank and absolutely decimated. It unhinges, it unhinges Sedgwick. This is the part of the battlefield also where Oliver Wendell Holmes, um, Robert Gould Shaw um, are, are going to be wounded. Uh, so some, some celebrities are found in this part of the battlefield as well. But it's interesting to note, could Hope have just portrayed artillery hell? Yes, but what's he do instead? He includes yet another, not totally futile, but a very desperate charge made by Union soldiers. Again, trying to convey, I would argue, some of this, I don't quite quite use the word anti-war, but it almost suggests an anti-war sentiment, someone who's uncomfortable, um, certainly with combat and um, seeking to express the repulsiveness of battle, the, the unnatural transformation of landscapes that he ultimately loved and admired so much. The final element I want us to think about is, again, how photographs influence the paintings. So once again, I've given you all a close-up. I'm going to go back. I apologize for going back and forth. But that scene blown up is this scene right here. If you're at the painting on the battlefield because the painting's so large, it reads relatively clearly. On a screen of this size, it reads as a pretty obscure spot. But again, it's incredibly telling that Hope does what? He almost replicates in perfect um, order the, the, the men who have been lined up for burial, the blasted caisson, the, the battlefield debris. So again, Alexander Gardner's images are influencing the way in which Hope is constructing um, his portraits of this battlefield. And so the artist is employing a whole host of tools as he's trying to convey these very complex scenes. And he's also trying to depict as realistically as possible the events that had occurred two-plus decades after the fact from when he was actually painting. Now, to bring this all home, I want us to think ultimately about how Hope displayed these images in the 1880s and how they're being consumed today. When audiences went to Watkins Glen, they had probably taken a picnic near the gorge. They had probably looked at the beauty of Rainbow Falls. They had, had soaked in the grandeur of this particular spot because they were visiting that area as tourists. When they came into Hope's Gallery, they certainly saw that because he had dozens and dozens of portraits that were in the style of the Hudson River School. But also in the midst of all of that, they were greeted by scenes like this, scenes of the battlefield. And Hope sought to augment these paintings by framing them according to a 1904 catalog description with, quote, weather-stained, bullet-riddled oak from the battlefield itself. So trees that had been felled by artillery, fences that had been taken down by infantry, were cut down and used ultimately to frame these pictures. Elements of the Maryland battlefield are being transported to upstate New York. At a time in American history when almost anything from the battlefield had assumed 
in the words of historian James Martin, a nearly mystical importance. Let's try and transport his audiences back to these scenes in time. So he's blending the battlefield's material culture with his visual depictions of war. And again, I think that the hope was really trying to encourage his audiences to contemplate very deeply the question of when is it right to go to war. And he says that. He says that his paintings are meant to plague soldiers, future soldiers, to ask themselves, this is worth it. Because he wants to show how terrible a thing war is. Now today, these paintings are housed at the Antietam National Battlefield. And in important ways, they continue to teach as the artist had intended. And most of you have either been to the museum or will be hopefully going to the museum, depending upon the weather on Saturday. Um, There's interpretive signage around them. There's artifacts from the battlefield in front of them. The murals themselves are now used as narrative tools. So the National Park Service has set them up um, in the uh, positions facing the ways in which they um, are depicting spots on the battlefield historically. And once again, they're meant to teach. They're meant to teach. And so, to me at least, it's profoundly fitting that Hope's testimony, his final testimony to war's realities, to war's horrors, resided in Antietam, where he himself, where he himself had been permanently changed, and that they memorialize on Antietam's sacred grounds in Hope's words how terrible a thing war is. So what we're going to do now is on Tuesday, we're going to move into the year 1863. Um, We're going to set up some foundational materials uh, for our trip to Gettysburg uh, one week from today. And other than that, I hope everyone has a good afternoon. On the way out, please give Jennifer your quizzes. Okay? Thank you very much, folks. You can watch Lectures in History every weekend on American History TV. We take you inside college classrooms to learn about topics ranging from the American Revolution to 9-11. That's Saturday at 8 p.m. at midnight Eastern on C-SPAN 3. I'm always enthralled 